lads, last time we recorded, we previewed the season. Now it is in full effect. How are we feeling? Hockey is truly back. I'm tired. Hockey is on. It's on. Is it on? I think it's on. Sports on Sportsnet have told me <laughs> a few times that it's on. An anonymous source. Like the, the hair call. dye on Friedman. It's on. Well, it, that. it's it, it speculation. Was, yeah, it was, yeah. Apparently not. Apparently not. But uh, the anonymous source told him that uh, it's on. He's not Kiprios. He doesn't dye his hair. Yeah, I wonder. Nick Kiprios dyes his hair. I swear I he does. So. It looks. It looks too perfect. Know. It's pretty funny. I found his. I saw his jersey on sale for the Leafs recently. Nick you Kiprios. think it's the one that got stolen? <laughs> I should report this theft. Exactly. Um, I mean, yeah, be a good citizen, right? I hear a siren in Montreal as we speak. Maybe they're going to Boston right now. I don't know. Celebrating the win last night, that's why. Yeah, yeah we'll get to that in the least wins as well. Like, yeah, here we go. Uh, four, three points on the year for the Canadians. Not a, bad, not a bad start. Scoring like nine goals. You love to see it. That's just weird. I'll tell you what, though, guys. It has been such a weird season to start because I didn't know if, if teams were going to do their uh, their home opening style player introductions. And I think the first game I watched was, because I think it was at six, it was the Buffalo... So the, no, no, because it was the Leafs game, and I don't remember them doing it. So then that day two of the season, it was Buffalo and Washington? Wa- yeah. And, and Buffalo did it, right? And they did their taxi squad and they go to the guys in the stands and like a few of them are waving. And this is, it was so bad. It was so like, so corny. And cause they, I don't know, like, do they wave? Do they not? We don't know. Like nice touch on Buffalo. Cause they got first responders to do the player introductions. Really, really nice. But the best part about this stuff is the players who do go the extra step like Mark Stone being named a star and waving to the end of the <laughs> biggest golden knife. <laughs> He's so pure. I love him. That's Captain Material right there, isn't it, lads? Absolutely. You know, on better circumstances, you know, I would have enjoyed it 100%, but I love Mark Stone regardless. I'm confused. Wait, why were you upset? Was, was Leonard in the net that night? I guess. Not the Ducks lost. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> Daniel's really getting into this Ducks fandom. I feel like we kind of threw it on him. You threw first, it on me, yeah. And now he's just embracing the uh, Ducks fandom. My true calling. Well, we're there, so we might as well touch on it, really. I mean, we, we just kind of have an ebb of flow. We used to have the power hour. We probably should have brought it back for today, but we're just yeah, okay. we're just shooting it here. We're, we're, mm-hmm. we'll work on it. We'll just chatting. With, yeah. Ducks have not won this year, but... Well, they, they lost, what was it, seven seconds into overtime last night? Max yeah, by, by your boy, Max. Yeah, he's not my boy anymore. He's not no. my boy. Nick's him. your boy now. Nick and Thomas are your boy now. Oh, no, don't get me started. No, 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 don't get me started. Though, um, if, if anyone's been the real story to the start of the Duck season, yeah, undefeated, you know, sorry, not undefeated, no wins. The Golden Knights are undefeated. Maxime Comtois, oh boy, has been the real star. God, if you, I think mean, he's up to three goals so far this season. It's just a shame the rest of the team couldn't really pick it up, especially for poor John Gibson, who really deserved a win last night. Yeah, um, and I think I mentioned in the text before is Maxime Comtois is taking that step. Even sh- He showed it in training camp. Is He's becoming everything of a prototypical duck draft pick of that power forward that can score. Um, and, you know, my heart is still with Nick Ritchie. But Maxim Comtois is becoming everything I kind of hoped for in Nick Ritchie. That's very fair. Where is Ritchie now? Boston. Right? He's in Boston. Got traded for Danton Heinen, which yeah, he took a dumb penalty or something. Pretty solid uh, trade. Uh, looking back, solid like the Kasha deal, and he's hurt. That's again, pretty solid. Is he? I, thought yeah. I saw Pete Blackburn make a joke of he's been hurt for, so he's been healthy for zero days, or something along that lines. Oh yeah, he left the game after. Miles Wood high stick. <clears throat> oh, that's rough. That's Not a good trade cool. looking. I mean, it's we don't never know, but that was actually a lot of ass. I mean, they had to get rid of David Backus's contract, so you know you had to add a few sweeteners there. But mm-hmm. it was a first Axel Anderson and David Backus yeah. for Andre Kasha. Yeah, I mean, good for the Bruins, but you know, yeah, you know, Jacob Perot, you know, he dropped for the Ducks with that pick, so mm-hmm. we'll yes. see. All right. Um. 
Is there anything else you wanted to touch on the Ducks? It's obviously a, a – we see the Golden Knights as a cup favorite, but it's very much a uh, – it's not an easy start for the Ducks because they have to go against that superstar team. They're hanging in there, but it's just maybe you can start seeing – no offense to the Ducks, maybe a gap in talent. It's like watching yeah. the Utah Jazz versus <laughs> the 80s Bulls. I mean, the Jazz were a powerhouse at the time too still. So. Not when Michael Jordan gets upset on the tee. No, he's not. Okay. Um, the, last dance. the way I see it is the Ducks are kind of sticking to what they've always had in terms of an identity. And I don't know if that's management or coaching, mm-hmm. which means is they still have that fourth line that can still fight but skate. Mm-hmm. But that really only makes sense if the other lines are producing the same way they used to. And you don't have that with a Getzlaff and a Perry one-two punch anymore. You're still figuring out a lot of things. So you have this abundance of forwards where I I want to see Max Jones in there, not Nick Delorier. I don't want to see Carter think... Rowney in there. I mm-hmm. want to see more of, you know, Troy Terry getting more minutes playing on the penalty kill. I that's it doesn't just make sense to me anymore when they do that. Or even on their bottom pairings where it's it's been better, but you know, I don't want to see you know, a Ben Hudden get more minutes than a Jakob Larson. Something we forgot to mention, yeah, they signed Ben Hudden. A fair deal. I thought that was I, – I like Ben Hudden a lot. Um, though, let's go into some more meaty content here. We always love growing the game. We want the game to grow. And you need personalities like Jacob Voracek, Alex, don't you? I loved see. I thought that was so funny. <clears throat> I actually brought that up to Mike. I was talking to Mike last night. And – um and I go, like, imagine, I'm just thinking, like, that should have happened with us. Like, I'm surprised Austin, Austin Matthews didn't go off in the summer when that guy asked him that question. Mm-hmm. Names will not be named, of course. Um, but, yeah, like, that was that was hilarious to see. And I, I think what's even better than that is Travis Konechny's face. Like, throughout the entire thing, he's just, he's in shock that, that Voracek, is doing that because it's like you don't really see that every day no um so for those of you who don't know listening uh after a post it was after the flyer's second game another win against the pittsburgh penguins uh, i think that was a game they chased jari out in the first period too um flyers beat reporter i know i'm not going to pronounce it right mike silski yeah that guy um asked for a question about you know the start of the season condensed how does it feel and Voracek completely chewed them out. There were some coarse language we can't use here. Called him a weasel as well. It was, you know what? I'm not surprised. You know, Friedman was talking about it last night on um, on Hockey Night in Canada. That you know, as a reporter, you expect that to happen to you. It's going to happen no matter what. Um, but it's always so shocking to see, especially in hockey, because we're just so used to the whole like. Um, um, you know, pucks in deep, they, they shut us down. We had a bad start. They got their chances. But Voracek is just giving it is because like the like Philadelphia is one of those markets, right? Like they're they've got they're ruthless there. Yeah. So I imagine I don't know the history between these two, but what I have seen from Flyers fans is is Voracek has obviously not been a fan of this guy before, and he just let loose. I loved it so much. Like he. He, he called him out, started answering the question, stopped, says, I don't know why I'm answering this, and then insulted him again. <laughs> he's like, he's just, but Voracek has had a weird start because he was, L.A. Vino has not been very, I'm not going to just give you the ice time. He's making Voracek work for it. And at camp, he was on the fourth line at times. And Voracek is somebody that very much prides himself on his two-way game as well. And you know what? I imagine there's also now going to be post that game. I'm sure there is a bit more added frustration, even if they do get the two points. They lose Sean Couturier in that sequence as well over those two games. Yeah. I can't pronounce the actual injury, but it's a rib injury, um, mm-hmm. and he'll be out two to three weeks, which basically is like four to six if you think about how this condensed schedule is. They're lucky to get these points early, fellas, but oh boy. Losing the reigning Selkie Trophy winner is – injuries are that much worse now, aren't they, Alex? They are. I want to try pronouncing this. <clears throat> okay. Cost, cost, costochondral. Costochondral separation. That's that as good as it's going to get. Yeah. 
I believe that's the cartilage being separated from the bone. Is what I, I think I, so. I, which two and three is my <clears throat> that sounds my painful. Reward, but you're a big fan of Voracek, Daniel. Um, I like him. I think he has. It's pretty funny. Um, he's just one of those guys that for so long Columbus had these top picks that they were just rushing into the NHL, and then he ends up being one of them that just develops into an all-star. Mm-hmm. Like when I think back, like Nikita Filatov or Derek Broussard, those guys drafted in that same range. I said Voracek, didn't I? Yes. I meant to say Couturier. <laughs> okay. I'm like, Sorry, have I talked about me. Jake Voracek? Okay. I'm like, that's 100% I'll go- on me. Okay. Talk about both of them. The Flyers are so fun. They are. Um. Yeah, I love Sean Couturier. I'm a big fan of him. I picked him for the Selkie um, trophy yes. back then. Um. You know, when we didn't know how long this was going to be, and we now look back on the before time when we could go out. And yeah, Sean Couturier, it's a big loss for the Flyers. I think they had that momentum, what they had last season, and they want to ingrain it this year. And, you know, a lot of things have kind of happened to that lineup already that I'm not really sure what they're kind of look like. You know, if you have Voracek on the fourth line, are you going to rely on Giroud to kind of, you know, pick up the slack when now you don't have Couturier. Like, are you going to put Giroud back at center or is Konecki going to be your top line center guy? And it's, it's weird to see. Uh, just one thing I'd like to comment on Jakub Voracek is Brian Burke talked about it yesterday with Dave Amber about from the management perspective on players speaking out like that to media, what do you do? And Brian Burke had a very professional response to that. Yes. He said, I agree that you should be able to speak out, but just take out the profanity. I think he also said that you can do it sparingly because you want the beat reporters, especially your local ones, you want them on side. And I think it's definitely like back in the day, you lived and died by your beat reporter. It's it's nowadays, it's much more watered down, but you want to keep them on side, right? Um, Anything else either of you want to add on the Couturier front? No, I just think it's a re- like just it's a really big injury for them. Like I think mm-hmm. Travis Konechny, I mean I, I, they've only played what two three games. I don't want to make too many judgments, but it looks like he's taken uh, quite like he's taken a step forward. Um, he's still what? How old is he? He's not even twenty five, is he? He's twenty three, I believe. Right, like he's still yeah. young. So it's like he's. With Couturier out, I guess this is kind of his time to really shine and prove himself. But it still is a big injury. Like he won Couturier won the Selkie last year, right? So that's a pretty damn big loss. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about the team that fell to them a few times. They're playing the the Caps right now. Are the Pittsburgh Penguins down two one at the first intermission? I believe. Uh, and we'll talk about with them. Beside the fact that the start of the season has been. Very bad. Very bad indeed. Um, They are apparently a team, this is reported on headlines last night, that the Penguins are interested in Jack Roslovic. Why? (laughs) Jerry McCann. McCann. (laughs) Jerry McCann with the the hits. I mean, okay, maybe this is just my thought process here, and maybe I'm completely off base, but they added all these like forward pieces. Like, you br- last season you bring in J- Jason Zucker. You add Brandon Tanev last off season. You re-sign Jared McCann. You bring in Kasperi Kapan, and who's I don't think is gonna play. He's not playing today. I think he should be ready for next game though. You bring in Mark Jankowski. You bring back Evan Rodriguez. You still have Zach Aston Reese. Like, do you see? Like, wh- I don't know what's the point of bringing this guy in. I know, I, I know that we need you need extra depth players, but you're going to give up an asset. You're, I don't know what you're going to have to give up, but the Penguins don't have their first, third, fourth, or sixth round pick this year. I mean, congratulations, you have three sevenths, but what are you possibly giving up to get back Jack Roslovic? That's One simple answer. answer. Samuel we'll Poulet. Yeah, we only talk about that. Or Pierre Oliver Joseph. <laughs> They're sick of their prospects. They got to go. They got to go. No, it's a very good question. 
I, I mean, I look at the pens and I'm like, well, first of all, if Russell makes upset because he wants to play in the top six, is he going to get a shot in that top six right away? Wait, no. reason my light stopped working and, and my mic as well. God damn it. I don't see the fit there. Like, well, so we were told when they, when they traded for Kasperi Kapanen that Kapanen was going to play in the top six, whether it be beside Malkin, whether it be beside Crosby, whoever. So your top six is pretty solid with Malkin, Crosby, Gensel, Zucker, um, Rust. Rust, and Kasperi Kapanen. Mm-hmm. Where is Jack Roslovic going to fit in there? Now, my argument was I don't think Kasperi Kapanen is going to work out on on the first line with Crosby. Just my my opinion, just based on him in Toronto. So what, is Jack Roslovic your insurance policy in case it doesn't work? I guess so. I don't know. Because is he a natural center or has he played the wing before? Um, I think he's a natural center and has played the wing before. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I'm just wondering that – because I know one thing that um, Mike Sullivan talked about is he really loves that third line they have right now going with Jankowski, McCann, and and Tanev. And I, I don't see them breaking that one up. That one's been pretty solid in terms of being you know, a legitimate checking line, something Pittsburgh didn't really have last year when you had – all these wingers going back and forth between the first line and the third line. And I I really don't, I really see it in a way is maybe they'll push someone off the fourth line and reestablish something somewhere in the top six afterwards. Because I remember looking at Pittsburgh's taxi squad and it's very thin. Yeah. Their taxi squad. I have it up here is Drew O'Connor, Pierre Olivier, Joseph, Alex Dorio, Anthony Angelo, Frederick Goudreau, and Maxime Lagasse. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Legacy Lagasse. Lagasse. He was like one of like the fifth Vegas guys. The Vegas. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember when two I'm, of those guys. Vegas first came to uh, Toronto. He was the one in net. Really? Yeah. Yes, I remember that. I went to that game. Well, oh. depends. Um, they're they're they'll be looking to beat the Caps today. Because um, they need to get their their season back on the right way. They need to do it now. Um, Another team that I think very much needs to do that as well. Well, it's really everyone. Um, We can tell right away. Right away. Watching one game after another. The rust is still there in games. Not just Brian Rust. But you know what? I think considering... That there was no camp, basically, and no preseason. Like, the first game, Leafs in Toronto, like, you could tell right away, like, no one was making passes. It was brutal to watch. But I I will give credit to the players. I think they're doing an all right job of it. But I I wonder also if, like, the Couturier stuff has been a result of, oh, boy. I think he's the first real injury we've seen. But this idea of, oh, God, condensed schedule, are we starting to see it now because they weren't able to ease in? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I kind of see it that way too, where, you know, you like the things I've kind of identified is either those skilled passes we've seen before are just not connecting or teams are playing it really safe. I remember watching the Calgary game last night where very short passes, no one was really kind of breaking out and they kind of played more of a conservative style. Same thing with the Ducks and same thing with the the Golden Knights where you you really kind of saw them really waiting for them to change their lines. You didn't really see things on the fly and not a lot of breakouts. How about you, Alex? Yeah, I mean, like, just the the entire – all the guys. And Adam brought it up with the Leafs. That first game was – it was sloppy, and, and it's expected, right? Like, this is all this is all expected. No, like, short and training camp, no preseason games. I this is all ex- for me it's at least it's all expected yeah naturally um but you know what there's a reason that they are the best athletes in the world when it comes to this sport um not why? the KHL not the KHL I mean <laughs> they're up there they're not terrible there's a reason Russia won gold without the Canadians there um 
one of those players, if we want to talk about, you know, overseas guys and, you know, someone who's making a difference right off the start, Kapil Crap. That was not how you say it, Adam. <laughs> Kirill Kaprasov of the Minnesota Wild. His debut game, three points, including the game winner, had an assist on the OT winner in the marvelous Minnesota comeback last night. So good, it made Dom decisions follow them on Twitter. Don't know if you guys are following that. It was really, really funny. But Minnesota, I'm not saying he's going to turn around the franchise. But it's a star up front in a year where they have a chance to make the playoffs. Will they be a first round exit? Probably. But I, I don't mean to downplay the kid, but it's something to get Minnesota excited about in a, a city that needs a bit of jolt when it comes to its hockey market. Alex. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He, I, I haven't seen, I haven't watched a full wild game yet. I've seen bits and parts uh, during other intermissions and stuff like that. But uh, the, he's, Kirill Kaprasov has looked damn good. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's taken this long, but it's worth it. Like there's no question about it. Mm-hmm. Daniel. I like that. Yeah, he provides a bit of that swagger or electricity that has been lacking in Minnesota. And when I look back on the other forwards they've had in the past, these mid first round picks, for example, that have all been traded away, basically. So like Lukunin, Alex Tuck, and even what they have now with with uh, Matthew Boldy or um, Joel Erickson Eck. There's just not that possessed in a way. There's not that, I guess, like player that you could say that, okay, this guy's definitely going to be in the top six. That's not named Zach Parise. Yeah. That you could finally say that not that he's going to save the franchise from becoming, I mean, they're not, they're not in dire, like dire straits or anything, but I think that just getting out of what we've said, like we don't know what they're doing and now there's a bit of a direction there. It's not that, and yes, sir. I should clarify. I don't mean that the cut that the Minnesota Wild are in risk of you know being Winnipeg here and, and leaving, as in respectability to that franchise. And even if it's not just Kaprasov being the guy, he'll be a damn good guy though. Mm-hmm. Boldy is helping that look. Rossi, when he's healthy, is going to help that look a lot. Um, and I'm not gonna lie. I love the market of Minnesota sports in general um, a lot of people give them crap for being the state of hockey but every time i've tuned into a minnesota home game it's always rocking there it's Those, pretty um, good people talk about buffalo fans deserving something they're getting out with the bills right now uh, minnesota deserves some stuff as well especially in that that hockey market gordon Bob- gordon bombay right at the front of it too um we wish we wish we wish one piece of news we should we should mention here is jimmy howard he's retiring and um I was actually surprised. That's not even the best part. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, we're not there. Yeah. So the Oilers need goalies because Mike Smith is on LTIR. I don't know what's going on with Anton Forsberg. They, they, he's been going that back and forth. Don't know where he's Like three end teams up. already. They, they signed another goalie, but he is. There's a whole visa thing going on there, I believe. They're looking for local goalies in the markets they're playing in, like amateurs, to be oh, a third God. guy. And Koskinen is not good. Stuart Skinner was called up, I believe, right? Yeah, he, he was the third round pick two years night, ago. Yeah. Because Smith and, is injured. Yes. Yeah. He's, yeah. They put him on LTIR. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he's, yeah. I mean, and it's Mike Smith. So the Oilers yeah. decided to call Jimmy Howard because remember <laughs> they did try and get Jacob Markstrom, gave him an extra year, didn't go, um, and they had to go back to Mike Smith for their goal time, along with yeah, Mika Koskinen, who has term that you Peter Shirell. And Jimmy Howard said, "Nah, I'm liking it with them. Got my time with the kids, my family. I'm gonna retire here." It's just really funny that the prospect, again, we've talked about this so many times, that playing with McDavid and the reigning Hart Trophy winner in Leon Dreisaitl was not enough to be like, Jimmy, we can do better than two wins. Come here, buddy. <laughs> it's just, I, I feel bad for Edmonton, and we'll talk about them a little later after yeah. the game against the Canadians last uh, night. But... I'm trying to figure out this situation. Like, You, you couldn't get Jimmy Howard on board? <laughs> Well, because here's the thing. So I I was thinking about it, how Jimmy Howard said, you know, he did want to play another year. I'm trying 
And I, I'm like, okay, does he just not want to play or does he just not want to play at Edmonton? Because if it is, he does not want to play at Edmonton. That is extremely embarrassing. Yeah. This is three out of three now that they couldn't get done. They couldn't get done. They couldn't. OEL wouldn't even put him on his trade list. Yes. Yeah. Jacob Markstrom took uh, uh, what Edmonton offered him seven years. He went to Calgary for a year less. Yes. And now they couldn't even get Jimmy Howard. Again, um, the Oilers. Well, let's see, think you know, about that. While we're here, we'll talk about them. They had an interesting start to the season. They traded wins with the Canucks. Now, the story that this the first game was simply that McDavid was not on the score sheet. There were defensive breakdowns. Costin was not great, and the Canucks prevailed. Naturally, the second night, McDavid had the hat trick, and they sung all the way home. Next, fast forward to their game against the Canadians, and Koskinen plays his third game for reasons we've just sort of mentioned. The Canadians kept McDavid to an assist. Phil Deneau and Nick Suzuki were staple to him all game. Um, and the assist was only because the Canadians fell asleep in 10 minutes and Slayer Cuckoo sniped a goal on Carey Price. How in the world? There was a mix of the Canadians simply outplayed the Oilers after an early game rush, and there was a mix of... Tyson Berry had a fine game in the offensive zone, but there was a play where somehow he ended up on the half boards, lost his stick, ended up behind the net, and there was a scoring chance for the Canadians. And it seems to me, my early impression of the Oilers this season is they have not changed at all from last season. And Connor McDavid in the post game was so fed up. So fed up. You know what? It was there was a nice little exchange when like Price called him the best player in the world. By the way, I can no longer say McKinnon is because now that Carrie Price has said that I have to follow. <laughs> oh, so Connor McKinnon McDavid said, Yeah, and Price does his thing and he blocked everyone out, right? And I wonder, like, this has got to be the last year if they don't pull it around, right? For Connor. It yeah. has to be. Mm-hmm. And I know it's three games in, but looking at it, what that team has been. Since he got there and before he got there. It, imagine this. It's post-pandemic, cross fingers, post-pandemic, 2021-2022 season. We got Jack, this, guys. Cross my fingers here. <laughs> Jack Eichel and Connor McDavid are on different teams. Imagine how crazy that would be. And it's like, there's a, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Yeah. It's insane. Um, but anyone can get traded. Anyone can get traded. If Wayne Gretzky can get yeah. traded, anyone can get traded. That's the mentality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The thing with Edmonton, and I think it I always had this theory, but I, I just I wasn't sure of it last year because of dry sidle. If Connor McDavid isn't on his game, and I think the same can be said if Leon Dry isn't on his game. I don't feel confident at all in that team. And this isn't me having a thing against the Oilers. This is just me like watching this team. And I, I've said it before. I don't trust their goaltending. I don't trust their defense. Like mm-hmm. their defensemen to play defense. I think Tyson Berry is a great addition. If you're thinking, Hey, we need an offensive defenseman. I was wrong last year. When the Tyson Berry trade happened and I was happy about it, I guess, I was completely wrong. I remember Chris I'll Johnson was very happy too. I think most people were happy because he seemed like an upgrade. Right handed defenseman, uh, you know, which, first of all, on its own is such a luxury, you know. Right. Not to mention, there was a thing of he had just become Colorado's leading defensive scorer of all time. Great personality, which a lot of people were saying is going to be great for the room. So what did they do? Like, I, what did they do to improve? Because I don't think their stre- their weakness was up front. Their weakness was depth. And I think they kind of addressed that, right? I think Turris and Dominic Cahoon were great ways to kind of fill that the depth and whatever. Josh Archibald was still playing on the first line last night. He was. 
What the hell? I, I did not notice him once. <laughs> what the not. hell? What? Do you, I, I can't be the only one who's confused about this. No, I'm, I'm right there <laughs> with you. And like, Terris, I noticed him. He had a good look last night. Mm-hmm. He almost got, like, he had a, a good, pretty good scoring chance. But even on, like, uh, it's just not what they need. It's like, if I look, if I think, like, the Oilers in their zone still scare me. And their defensemen, I'm just still not. Like, there was a really, really set of bad bounces there. On the power, oh, sorry, on the Oilers when they were on the penalty kill, there was a point where Petrie comes in for a shot, bats it down, goes through his Koskin and legs. He can skate around to the other side of the ice, goes, like, behind the net. And he's left wide open to get his own rebound. Now, was it a fluke that it completely went through Koskinen's legs? Yes. But then you have the two of them just puck watching the crease. And there's just no awareness. And then there was... I'm trying to remember what the second one was. I'll come back to it. But it was just... it was Yes, no, it was like Ethan Bear is letting himself get pushed in towards the crease. Has his ass turned towards Koskinen. Petrie's shot goes off of his butt. So, like... Just the awareness of some of their defensemen. And Ethan Bear is a fantastic defenseman. Mm -hmm. It was just a real, real mess. And it was, again, there was a time when McDavid got around Edmondson. And obviously, I just screamed, no, 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 please don't let this happen. Luckily, McDavid was stopped by Price because he played lights out last night. But it's just such an oilish thing that if that goal had gone in, it was probably going to things were going to win the game anyway but it would have been a much much different game but again that's it it was the only real look they had last night was Connor McDavid and again I didn't notice that much of Leon Dreisaitl either and is this the moment those two are out of the game they're out of a factor and normally they are always one but if you've got a good pair of shutdown players then the Oilers aren't a threat I, I think mean, that's can, the thing. Sorry, go ahead. So, sorry. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. But uh, it's it's what we've talked about before, and I think there's two things. There's this expectation from what Edmonton has that certain players, not namely on Dreisaitl or Connor McDavid, are going to play above every night what they're kind of capable of. And we've talked about the defense without Oscar Clefbaum where you know it was kind of spotty even with him in the lineup, but to take out – their best defenseman is already something that it just looks like patchwork Mm -hmm. here and there. And when it comes to that offense, I think it is still that identity. It's still, all right, let's build off of, you know, our two guys' success and see what we can do. But when that's not there, they just don't know what other options they have. And I completely agree. Josh Archibald, first line, Kyle Turris, you know, I, I thought that was a solid signing, but, Again, it's just these guys that you expect to play above what what they can produce. And, you know, Edmonton's done this so many times. Um, you know, if we think about Andreas Antonisiu, and Andre Sequeira, I remember when he got that big contract, expected to be a top defenseman for them. It's just the reoccurring thing about, okay, what can we throw at McDavid and Dreisaitl and see what sticks? Adam Larson scored the other night. I think it was like the second Vancouver game. It was like, Adam boy, like you shouldn't be cheering at the wall that Adam Larson finally got himself a goal. And like, I feel terrible for that guy. I was happy for him, but it's just, that's the, the sort of bar that the Oilers are at. And people can go on as much as they want about the fact that McDavid and Dreisaitl are themselves tertiary scoring. But the moment you shut that one player down, yeah. Then it just exposes your depth. And when you go against a team like Montreal, who are, their identity is the four-line system, then all of a sudden you have half of your offense that just can't stack up. It's the, it, it's the argument that in hockey, a player can only affect so much. Mm-hmm. In, ba- in a sport like basketball, LeBron James could literally play the entire game if he wanted to. That's just not possible in hockey. So there's only so much Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl can do to possibly affect the outcome of a game. They can't play defense either. Right. In front of that the goalie. Too. No. Um, hey, you want to look at a player dominating a single game in basketball. Just watch the last dance. I'm so on it. As Donald called me, basketball guy, Adam. I love it. So, it's so funny. It's such a funny series. 
Right. Um, before we go specifically into the Canadians and the Leafs themselves, we'll talk about Evander Kane a little later. First week of hockey, here we are. Let's go, let's go, let's go. You guys, I'll start with Alex here. A team or a player that surprised you so far? Uh, let me think. Like, I, I want to say Minnesota. I Like, I don't, I don't know why. Like, I feel like all the guys who have really um, – really impressed so far have kind of been the obvious. And if you look Mm -hmm. at at the outcomes of games and stuff like that, the one team that, I mean, I know it's only two games in, but in Minnesota seemed to have, have, have this different step. Like Kirill Kaprasov has kind of changed watching the, watching the Minnesota wild, Minnesota wild. Mm -hmm. Um, Daniel, what about you? And you can't say Max Comtois. (laughs) <laughs> okay um this Shucks. is just a surprise based on the score but it's just kind of something i kind of predicted and that's the saint the saint louis blues oh, come on, I, come on. <laughs> I mean like i know it's just like that game but seriously eight zero i know colorado is colorado but my goodness that was rough that looked like a team we thought didn't have the identity because they've replaced so many guys. Okay, okay, hold on a minute. You, you, you. I watched like the first period because I was way too tired mm-hmm. to like finish it. And like I remember Bennington was playing really, really well, and I was like, "All right, this will be fun." I woke up and it was yeah. what was it eight nothing? I was like, "What? What happened?" What, it a was lot that. of miscues was... there, and it's from guys that I didn't think. You know, I, I expected you know maybe a Mike Hoffman or a Tory Krug like misplay but there were two bad misplays by Vince Dunn in his own end and Bimington wasn't ready when that happened I think you just have it out for him Jordan Bimington you know it's funny I actually like the guy yeah it's just like I don't know there's something about Alex Patrangelo leaving there it just kind of changed things for me it's just it reminds me of Jim Rutherford of you already won two cups stop moving everything yeah um, they go a bit overboard in that 15% roster turnover thing. See, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Everyone I had sort of thinking to be as a surprise just kind of upset me. I had St. Louis. They've been good. 8 nothing loss. The Islanders, then they get stamped by um, New York after Sorokin gets forced into the game. I thought Buffalo were sort of hanging in there against Washington. They lost both games. I can't go with Ottawa because I was already saying Ottawa would have been fine. And I was going to say Detroit because they won last night, but at the same time, they got shut out in game one. So I'm going to go with an individual player here. And it's going to lead us into our next segment so I can be cheeky about this. And because I had very tempered expectations on this guy, and I am amazed that he's been this good. And that's Alexander Romanov. My guy. I, I just... like I, There was always questions about like how good is he going to be offensively? And just the, the main thing you always say about him, and it's such a comment for a rookie, is he seems like he's been playing for five years. And he's, it's so weird. He's not afraid to do anything. Like some of the plays he's making on the offensive zone, I see, all right, here's 27. Oh, what do you do? Oh, that worked. Okay. It's just he's taking so many risks. And it's not like ones that are totally like, are you are such an idiot? What are you doing here? But it's just, I don't know if it's because I see him as a rookie and he just comes out and, and people have made a very good point that he isn't one because he's been playing in the KHL. But again, like the adjustment to North American ice for him. And again, he's, he's looking all right on the power play, which is so weird. There have been a few defensive, like, okay, what are you doing there? Like in the break, to, they broke it down on the Leafs one. I'm um, sorry. After they, in the pregame yesterday, like how he was supposed to take Simmons and it almost led to a, a Leafs goal. But I am so impressed with him to start the season. And I, I seriously, I hate to say this about a rookie NHL defenseman, but I am, I'd be so amazed if he's not in the top four by like Christmas, not Christmas. We're not in October. We're in January. Hmm? Well, when's the next big holiday? Easter? When's uh, Easter? Valentine's Day. I would be amazed if he's not in the top four by Valentine's Day. Wow. I don't know when that that's, is. Uh, that's good. Ca- is that close? Less than, than a month it? away. Wow, oh, okay. uh, guys. I mean, he's okay. Whatever. No, yeah, he does March. look good. Yeah, you're no, you're right. I um, he 
they were even saying it on the broadcast. Now I don't remember who was saying it. I want to say I think it was Kelly Rudy. Might have been it. It was it was a Sportsnet broadcast. It was just before uh, the Oilers and the Canadians and the Sens and Leafs started, and they were saying like, why not try him? It try him in that role in a top four role, like consistently, maybe not, maybe that's too much to start with, but at least give him a try there. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing you're pointing out about, it looks like he's been playing for five years. I thought was interesting because it feels like he, like, I feel like we think when you're playing in professional leagues in, in Europe, it's not the same. But I think there is a there's a lot of similarities because you're playing, especially with Romanov, because he's playing in the KHL. It's not like he's playing in the MHL or VHL where it's more like younger guys. Mm-hmm. He's playing against professional hockey players. Yes, they're not in the NHL. It's the KHL. So I think, yeah, you're right. Like he, It doesn't look like he minds taking risks. And I feel like that definitely comes from the fact that he's been playing in the KHL for the last two years. Mm-hmm. Daniel, you're the Ducks fan. You love the defenseman. The board on the young, the young Canadians or rookie. I really like Alex Romanoff. I think for the last two years, we've been really speaking about him. That he is someone that I could see becoming a legitimate top two, top four guy for the Canadians. And I like what Alex said about that, about that professionalism, where we said like he's been playing for five years. It's just like he just knows kind of the cues on things because he's been playing with men since he was 16, 17. And he's just someone that I really like that Mark Bergevin has been so patient with him. Like he, he technically could have come last year, but the fact that they still let him play in a position where he could still get the minutes where now, yeah, he's going to play in the third pairing, but you know, they're putting him in situations now that he's getting accustomed to the speed of the game. He's getting accustomed to what I think is going to be a bigger challenge for him now is the amount of games and the frequency that's going to happen with these. Mm-hmm. Um, I think his contract in the KHL was up, actually. I don't think he could have come last year. Oh, okay. okay. But I mean, was- in terms of talent-wise. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, like, sorry, he was yeah, more yeah. than ready, yeah. Totally, yeah. Like, they've been... There was... Burke said, apparently he talked to Bergevin. He was like, Edmondson was a 5-6 signing and Romanov was a top four. And, like, I know Bergevin has a reputation for apparently being a very good talent, like, a very, very good evaluator of talent. And Romanov is another example. And, like, with the Canadians, the season, like, the story is they need Suzuki KK, and they need new additions and Romanov to really be difference makers. And so far, he's doing that. Um, what I like, I okay, before, sorry, before we move yeah. on, it's just with the Canadians where I like what you mentioned, that there's that balance now where – what we said before in terms of the depth where there's a good mix. Like they have these up and coming guys who are going to be your future cornerstones, Mm -hmm. but they're also getting, you know, the masterclass from these solid veterans that they could still produce at a high level. Yeah. Um, I say, well, let's just preview. Sorry. Let's just look at what happened when the Oilers game, and then we can sort of transition into like the Leafs and the Canadians one. And we can focus the rest of the show Mm -hmm. on the Leafs. We can finish off with Evander Kane here. Um, And it was, first of all, what was last night? What day of the week was it? Saturday. Saturday. I think it was Saturday. Losing track of days. And it was the return of Mr. Saturday Night. Terry <laughs> Frost, my, yeah. my boy. Oh, I had to think on that one. <laughs> I thought we were, I didn't know where we were going there for a second. Oh, yeah, same here. <laughs> no, no, it was the return of Mr. Carey Price. Um, a great performance from the Canadians, really. Uh, dominant for all but 10 minutes of their game versus the Oilers. Uh, in a game, three different goal scorers. I believe it's been five different guys who have scored all the top of my head to start the season. The power play has looked surprisingly effective. Like, power play goes in consecutive games, which is like, what's what's happened here? This is not normal. I cannot believe this is happening. And what's really burning on the Oilers last night is, is the Canadians just have this sort of I want to say it, it's really um, a battle of, of attrition with the Canadians. It's just wave after wave after wave of it. Like you really are now seeing the vision and Claude Julien's utilization of the four line system. It was, I think last night, Petrie got a, got a pair. Tatar obviously scored. Evans got one, a shorthanded unassisted goal, which was, which, which, 
it, it was a rebound, but it really should have been an assist. But you know, whatever. Evans got it. It's fine. We love him. And then you also have from the upper line, Anderson and Suzuki scored against him in the Leafs. Sorry, scored against the Leafs for the Canadians. So a good start for them that we're seeing the production from all four lines so far. Exactly what we needed to see from Montreal, Daniel. For them to be successful, I mean. Yeah. But, uh, in, I mean, even against the um... – even against the Leafs, it was the same thing. I didn't. Wa- I just watched the highlights of the uh, of the Edmonton Montreal game, and it's like, I mean, we talked about Edmonton side before. It's and to look at it from Montreal side, it's one thing for a team to play to not play very well, but it's another thing that the t- that their the opposing team has to actually capitalize on it, and it seemed like Montreal capitalized on it. There was almost a. I, it's weird to think that I would almost describe the Canadians play style as we're going to suffocate you with just shots on net. We're going to crash. The, like watching Joss Anderson, I'm like, is that Brandon Gallagher, but just faster and taller? It's really weird to think. Daniel, I think you, you, I asked you, you did tune in for some of the Montreal game as well. What were some of your thoughts from it? Um, For me, and I think this has just been the huge change this year. And the one word that comes to mind is character is that this team now kind of has fostered an identity that could propel them further. That what we've talked about before, and I always use the example, our Terry Lekkonen's not playing on your first line anymore, on your second line. He's not getting a whole bunch of minutes. And, you know, we'd like the guy on the team, but, you know, we just don't think, we just don't think he's top six material there. But what I kind of see it now is, you know, they're just going not one way or the other in terms of the youth, in terms of the veteran, uh, the, the veterans on the team, but there's that leadership there that is going to help this team moving forward. Like everyone in a way knows their role on this team and they're just embracing it. And I just really like seeing that like Tyler to I, I still think one of the best signings. He's, he's going to score soon. He's getting chances. It's the one thing with that line is I think they're the only one who haven't scored yet, but they like Suzuki Anderson and Druin have just found chemistry like that all of a sudden. I almost snapped. I've never gotten that close. Really? Anyway, I, I can you snap, that. Alex? Anyway, so they found chemistry right up. By the way, if we get this Jonathan Druin all year, I'll be so happy. He's been so good. You beautiful man. Mikel, who? I mean, no, they won the cup, man. Like, they won okay, the trade. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> they won the trade. It's over. Try and that. <laughs> the tra- um, it's but we over. won the Jeff Petrie Taylor. <laughs> oh, of course, right. yeah. Um, though, Where's, well, I don't. I actually don't even know what they like because I remember Steve Dangle did a trade tree on he Jeff tried Petrie. To make it sound on his, No, it's terrible, man. Um. Well. well yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Um. To just sort of bring it back here. Um. What was I even saying? Yeah, yeah. So the chemistry, like Toffoli is getting, like you're noticing he's getting his shots away. It's only a matter of time, but him, Armia, and Kakiemi have to keep building chemistry. And again, neither of them have been bad. I would say maybe take a look at Armia somewhere else. I don't know if he's sort of gelling there. Um, but the same thing, like Byron and Lekkonen have been getting their shots in too. Like it's always a pleasant surprise to see the fourth line. I'm like, oh, Byron and Lekkonen. I love you guys. Oh, nice little chance there. You'd love to see it. Kind of wish, though, Byron hadn't turned over the puck in overtime against the Leafs. And we'll go there. It was we, – we talked about it last episode, but at the end of the day, the Canadians blew a 3-1 lead. It was not because Wayne Simmons decided to throw a punch at Anthony Stewart. It was because the Canadians – and this was an issue against the Oilers. They have young centermen. And they can't win face-offs. They, they, yeah. it's, it's been a re- it's two of the guys are on, and then two of them are off. Like Evans and Kakinami were on last night. Dino and Suzuki were the only ones above fifty percent against the Leafs. And a lot of the Leafs' goals were from dumb penalties from the Canadians, which when you have the elite talent the Leafs do, especially on a five-on-three, and a lot of them were great face-off plays, especially the Nylander one. Um, Tavares also great work in front of the net, but it all came from the fact that the Leafs were able to win faceoffs, um, and then of course a two-on-one in overtime, um, and the Leafs also would carry that against the Sun. But first, before we go there, actually, um, your guys' thought from the Leafs in that win over the Canadians to open the season? Um. Okay, so. They were not the better team. I don't think they've been the better team in any of the games they played. 
and and obviously i'll talk about the ottawa stuff after because i have some stuff to say um but against montreal see the thing is the first game i gave them the benefit of the doubt i said you know what okay this is a warm-up game kind of because you know you haven't played since uh jill august um short in training camp i've been told everyone's in the best shape of their lives okay this is what i've been told it's anonymous sources etc but um i mean listen like it was sloppy right i think mm-hmm. most i think that was the thing we got out of it and because it was sloppy it was entertaining weirdly enough um but in terms of the leafs i think the I'll disagree with you a little bit. I think the fight did help a little bit. After the fight, there was a little bit more of a jump in their step. I don't necessarily think the fight directly impacted the game, but I think it gave them a little boost, right? Because that's the whole idea. Like if you get into, when a team gets into a fight and all this and that, it it gives them I mean, if and the NHL video game tells you anything, if you win a fight, apparently all your stamina is restored. But, yeah. uh, but I think it does give a, a little bit of an oomph to their to their game um, after that fight. Yeah, it was, but it wasn't directly impacted. No, no. If you um, want to say that that caused the pressure where Suzuki took the hold, I get it. But in the moment, somebody's like, "That's the reason Shea Weber threw a puck over to the class." I'm like, "Get out no, of here!" No, 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 <laughs> get, that's that's get, though. That's not what happened. But mm-hmm. other than that, it, it was like, okay, this is a good game. Like I I, it, uh, I think that game, the third line, I really like the third line, which was Kerfoot, Hyman, uh, Mikheyev. Actually, I've liked that third line the in all their games. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Nylander. I, Nylander was incredible that first game. I don't He's care what anybody said. By the way, is he? I know people talk about Matthews. Nylander always buries the Habs. I hate huh. it. That second goal was was something else. All that knee, all that Nylander slander. Get out of here. Yeah. Go home. Go home. We're on his official it's fan over. club. It's over. I've been, <laughs> I've been on the fan club for a while. I remember, I think there's only three points, guys. I don't care. I don't care. Um, but yeah, just from that game, that was about it. Sloppy but entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to ask you guys about one thing from this game, and then sorry, that's you first, Daniel. Your your t- your take on it. I don't want to. I don't mean to skip you, but there's oh, one no more problem. Thing from this game I want to talk about before we move on to Ottawa. Yeah, for sure. I think what I kind of liked about that, from the Leafs' perspective as well, is those elements we've seen added in the off season has just been on display. I thought the Simmons fight was just kind of reminiscent of that that this is what he kind of brings to the team and this is what you want to expect moving forward i don't think it was the x factor in the game per se but it was a nice kind of yeah it did count but a a nice dress rehearsal of what's to come for the season from the leaves and what we've said before like they weren't really the better team that montreal's depth really kind of got to them but this is a team where i think that there's enough there to kind of work out those those gaps we saw the last two seasons is that what we said number one the leadership number two the depth it's just there's enough there that they could figure things out that i think i still think that they're gonna have a successful season just before you go before we go to ottawa yeah just before we speak on I just want to speak on the whole the whole fight thing quickly. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's very similar to the situation that happened against Columbus, where Jason Spezza fights whoever. I don't remember exactly who he fought, and they end up coming back from that lead. I don't think the fight necessarily said gave the team um, inspiration to fight back but i think it gave them an um, uh, like that same thing that gave them like a jump in their step like we got we have to do this and they did like they should be able to do that without jason spezza fighting but that's another story yeah it probably helps the the say like simmons jerseys are flying off the, the shelves now i bet like yeah. people are gonna love him right away. not then. zach bogosian jerseys not, no, no, no 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 yours is a gem the Lines only time I noticed Zach Bogosian in that game was when he was going to the box. I was like, man, what do you do with dra- the I, grabbing Suzuki's jersey? That's such a uh, dumb pun away. I took the jersey. I took I I started the game, that game, with the Bogosian jersey on. After he took the two penalties, I took it off. I put the Tavares jersey on. Mm-hmm. 
All right. I would think that as a Habs fan, I'm pretty complimentary of Austin Matthews. So yeah. what the hell was with that first game? Like they had him on the, the penalty kill. And I'm like, okay, it's brave yeah. that your first penalty kill is against Shea Weber. Yeah. And I was like, I, I understand not wanting him to go and block a Weber shot. Like he's broken teammates about that. Like we lost Brandon Gallagher and Patch Ready for a while because of that. <laughs> Brandon, yeah. Like, like, why are you starting him then? Like, it, it's um, it's odd. So we we always like. When training camp started, it was the rumor that came out, right? Uh, Keith's going to play him on the penalty kill. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? It might be a good idea just to see what he does because I think the whole idea is he needs to – and we saw it at, at the end of last year, especially that his 200-foot game improved. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, let's just throw him into the fire here. Let's see if he's – how well he's improved at his 200-foot game. And I yeah. guess putting him on the penalty, penalty kill helped. Um I don't know if playing your first PK against Shea Weber is the smartest move, but I don't know. Right into the deep end, I think, yeah. with that move. Yeah. Like, I, I just, when I see a penalty killer bend from a shot, I'm like, like, I get it. Like, you do not want Austin Matthews, if he's out for any period of time, like any, any team losing a player of that caliber, that's dangerous. Yeah. It's just like, I just, I, there's just a part of me, like the moment I see a penalty killer go away from a block shot, I'm like, that's not great. Like that, that's the last thing you want, right? There's, there's the trick that people, like Tavares joked a few years ago when he was still an Islander. I think it was, it was a round table with like Stan Coast and he's like, I've, I've mastered the art of looking in the lane, but not blocking the shot. Like at least just like, dude, like, it just, it looked weird to me. That and like, listen. Ben Chirot's an idiot, right? Like he shouldn't have done that fight. Okay, I like I like I don't know what he was thinking. Though I don't think it was the worst thing that he was cross-checking Austin Matthews in oh. front of the net. Like that no, is it a wasn't. it really that wasn't. is a net front battle. Like if you're going against the Montreal Canadiens, like even before Edmondson showed up, Ben Chirot and Shea Weber's half their game is you're in front of the net. Like anyone who has an elite goalie. Or anyone who has the thingy to stand up for their goalie, if you're a 50 goal scorer, like potential guy like Matthews, would have scored it last year. Might have done it other years if he had stayed healthy. What in the world do you think is going to happen if you go to the net? Like, that's how it works. Like, dude, you've been playing against Brendan Gallagher for a few years. That's where people make their, like, Wayne Simmons. Like, that. like yeah. The uh, worry with, with the Gallagher contract, with Anderson, the reason that Simmons isn't a 30 goal scorer is because that's where they make their money and they get cross checked all the time. Yeah, I don't. What are you doing? I, I don't know what that was about. Like, I mean, I saw, I saw, it, I haven't seen it from the players and I could have, I could have missed it. I saw it specifically from the agent. Yes. That's, yeah. I'm like, bro, like, really? Is this really what we're going to complain about? Like, like I thought it was a little players. ridiculous. Yeah, More voices from the agents recently, I've, I've noticed. Like when, um, when, a la Mark Andre Fleury. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, that was, <laughs> like, when Patterson was getting crap, that wasn't just net front stuff. He was getting. No. Calls were not that he was getting thrown on the ice, and there should have been calls. And it was the same with McDavid. Yes. Like, go watch any game from last year. He it's a, he needs to speak up more, McDavid. By the way, he mm-hmm. he's the opposite of Crosby in his early career, really. Because like, uh, it's I just like, dude. It's if we want to live like net front battles, and I don't think I like this game anymore. And like, no, that, you know, yeah, me, I don't weird. care about fights, but if you get from the, get rid of the net front battle. Like, that's yeah I, I think i think it was an agent just talking to talk i hate agents you know that it, yeah like it's that trend that i haven't really seen until recently that the agents go to social media about this because like even in the nba uh, the you know the league of outspoken players you don't see that from their agents um if we want to talk about agent talks and i feel like alex and i just looked at the same yeah. thing mike just sent us the thing saying and i was going to say this for a little later um, we'll come back. We'll go to the Ottawa games in a second here. Uh, we found out right before the show because we start recording at 1230. Um, that's right after waiver wires start Smart. going out. Um, Jason Spezza and Aaron Dell were waived by the Leafs. Aaron Dell, there's a good chance he might be. Good third goalie. But um, the real people were really going about Jason Spezza. And it's just come out that apparently, this is from Chris Johnson as well. So pretty, 
Not many people know more about the Leafs and what's going on than Chris Johnson. Maple Leafs, Spezza will retire if claimed on waiver, as agents say. Whoa. And uh, that's a big reason why he had his trade protection in Dallas. He doesn't like – he's got a young family. Um, he doesn't like being moved. Like, he want, naturally, you think when you'd sign somewhere, you want to be there. So um, – Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I think that – I think – I don't think Dubas throws him on waivers without knowing that this is kind of the case. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And I and I think the league knows, like the other teams know that. Like the only reason he resigned is because he Toronto wanted to resign him. I think the rumors were he was going to retire. Yeah. Um. Sorry, what was the question that we were talking about before? What was it? Um, ah, the the, uh, the, 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 the the checks. Okay, so here's my theory on what happened. I think the agent spoke out, and I think all of Toronto hopped on it because. Toronto, uh, Toronto media is s- smart in some sense. Anytime an agent speaks out, they know it's going to get clicks. Yeah. Go back to Marner, go back to Matthews, go back to Nylander. That was an absolute bloodbath in this city. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why it became a bigger story than it really needed to be. If it was anybody else, no one would have said it wouldn't. No one cares. I swear, though, if next time these two teams play, if there's a single cross-check called on Ben Chirot, I'm going to lose my mind. Even and if it's a legitimate cross-check? Yeah, okay, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. I'm ben excited Chirot- for the next game. This first one was a carousel of fun. It was so fun. Yeah, we even, it, was, yeah it was so good. It was so it good. It was. A lot of fun like guys it. out there. Yeah, I mean, good players, good teams, and high scoring. And then the thrilling overtime, even though it looked like everyone was so tired. Like, that did no breakaway. It was like, do you have to get some of those Energizer, like, bunny? What is the like, picture, Energizer, by the way? The one I shared on Instagram? That was a nice one, though, right? On it was a good away. picture, yeah. Yeah, it was great. Um, so moving on, though, the Leafs and the most Leafs, I think – Friday and Saturday were the most Leafs hockey that I've ever seen. It was the disappointing game versus Ottawa to then come out and victoriously be led by Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner for a win on Saturday. Um, Where would you guys like to start exactly here? Uh, Well, I mean, Daniel can go first. uh... All right. Um, You know, basically what Austin Matthews kind of said about that expectation coming into Ottawa and – yeah, they're not going to be a contender this year, but they're a team that could really surprise people with the amount of players they have. And they spoke about it before yesterday's game in terms of that balance they have where they have so many young guys, but they have other players they brought in to kind of say, this is how it means to be a pro player. And, you know, what we talked about with Erica Branson, you know, he's not the top four guy we expected him to be from the draft, but he's someone that's played a lot. Um, Evgeny Daninov played a lot, KHL and also NHL. And I guess, you know, Matt Murray, you know, it's, it's still a bit of the awkward sequences with him there, but he looks comfortable out there. He looks like a guy that could reclaim his starting position with, you know, without that, other expectation that okay you got to lead us to the playoffs at the same time too it's like no just focus on being competent Mm -hmm. Alex um I mean I think this can apply for both games Mm -hmm. I I don't think they look like the better team in either game I think get my that's my opinion like game one they look good the first period on at points it looked like they were literally on the power play and it just went downhill it just went downhill. Like when you said it uh, a couple episodes ago, or it was last episode, you can't walk into Ottawa and think you're going to win easy. You can't. And the same, you know what? That same thing could was applied to Vegas a couple years ago mm-hmm. or a few years ago now. And the same thing should honestly be applied to Montreal. I think not many teams, like I think now they see them as a threat. I don't think the first couple games they did, the first game at least. I think the first game. I mean, it was it was messy to to begin with, but they. I don't think they've looked like the better team even last night. Like the thing with this team, and I'm I always get frustrated with because I feel like they they've never learned. 
and I don't know how to fix this and I don't know who to blame because I think the blame is on the players, but a lot of people seem to want to blame everybody else. And I think it's the stupidest thing. Um, yeah. I don't know how you blame Dubis because he's literally made all the changes possible. And like, you can't blame the coach because they've narrowed on their second one now. The fact that people think he's on the hot seat and he's like, has an above 500 coaching record and he's what he's hasn't even coached 50 games is the, the craziest thing to me. It's crazy. He's on the hot seat. Really? There was, there was some BS going oh, around. No. Oh no. But it was, it was from no one legitimate. Um, okay. So like the idea that the idea that to blame these things on one player, I think there's times to be to blame specific players for specific things. For example, last year when Kasperi Kapanen throws his broken stick, at, I don't say was it Shea Weber, Jeff Petrie, Jeff Petrie, Jeff Petrie. dumb Never move, forget. stupidest thing I've ever seen. That's easily blamed on him. But when you as a team do not look like you care. No, I'm not. I, I'm not blaming. I'm not going to blame Austin Matthews for this. I'm not going to blame Mitch Marner for that. It's ridiculous. It's it's a crazy. It's a crazy thing to to expect to blame it on one person. I think yes, Freddie has had his issues. He's not looked great. Mm-hmm. But the entire team, like that second game, the first game against Ottawa, TJ Brody looked horrendous. Last night he, last night it was better. But the issue at the end of the day, the issue still is being consistently consistent. This team has been consistently inconsistent for five years. Mm -hmm. So something eventually has to change. I don't know what it is. And it's a matter of being looking like you care. If they lose and they look like they care, I will not complain. Because it looks like they were there to win the game. Sometimes you face a hot goalie. Like that happens. Sometimes the other team gets the best of you. As long as you care. You can have an off night once in a while. When it is the second game of the year that it is your off night and you don't look like you care. No wonder I'm going to like, no wonder people are going crazy. Looking at all angles of that, I think when... That does happen, and I think the one thing we've talked about, and that is Frederick Anderson, Jonas Siegel, he did write about that in The Athletic recently, about working out the kinks. And, you know, he's in his contract year, so I think that's one thing to kind of think about, too, where I love Freddie, you know, he's ever since he's been a duck. I think he's an amazing player, amazing goalie, but, you know, the consistency has to kind of be there, and it's a shortened season. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm confident Jack Campbell's there. I'm really confident that he has been, you know, a competent backup, you know, shout out to Michael Hutchinson. You know, we think you were okay. But what I think about is still in the organization. Yeah. What I kind of think about in that sense is how that, I think that's what, that's one thing that's going to, we're going to keep looking at is the goaltending. And it's also, again, the contract year and how Freddie's going to play to like play for his next contract and see where his future is for the Leafs. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about the goalies, Stewart joked about it. And then he think he joked about it after the game. And then it's always a thing on Leafs Twitter. The goalie war. First off, no. I love Jack Campbell. Jo- well, everyone does. He's just such a nice guy. Him. Congratulations to Tim Stutzler for scoring his first goal, by the way. The hand yeah. eye on that. And how Campbell just wanted to shake <laughs> his hand. Oh, he's like a Care Bear. I love him. Him and Cole Caulfield would be the best of friends. Is it? Does Jack Campbell not remind you a little bit of James Reimer? I was telling Mike last night. I said, I'm not gonna lie. Jack Campbell gives me James Reimer vibes. Yeah, um, just lovable guys. Yeah, Steve loves who them might have who might have to be the starter next year. And oh, you no. know, with, <laughs> I just wonder what is the leash. And no, yeah, against the Canadians, there there were some like the Tatar five five hole. That yeah, was... it was a breakaway, but like I think they were saying Ouch. Freddie's pretty bad between his. Lo- that sounds really weird. You know what I mean? His five hole is not the greatest, but I just wonder what the leash is like for Freddie. And I'm obviously I'm not trying to say. I think You're trying to start a controversy. A, a few years ago, Alex, when I actually said I thought at one point he was top five goalie in the league. 
because he was he was legitimately uh, okay i was looking people yeah. talk like there was a legitimate argument to be made that he could get serious pheasant votes and he had that groin injury mm-hmm. and then it feels like things have just not been right since then and you know what's important for a goalie they're growing they're growing the way they split in that it's in, it's it's important and i just i wonder what the how long it is for anderson until they they start saying because of again yeah. these you guys are saying the shortened season when they say all right jack and again I, and i know jack campbell has never had the the starting position really in his career since the windsor spitfires since the windsor spitfires uh, listen well, I mean, if, yeah. if there's a time to prove yourself in that organization with Frederick Anderson's contract situation. Now's the time for him. He can take advantage of this. Can Jack Campbell. He he definitely can. I don't think there's a goaltending controversy yet. Because, listen, last night, I thought, to be honest, I thought Jack Campbell was the best player on the ice last night for the Leafs. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he didn't have to face the toughest shots and that many shots, but I still think he was he was – he was by far, I thought he was the best player on the ice last night, along with the third line. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. But mm-hmm. I don't think there's necessarily a goaltending controversy yet. I think there's potential to be if Freddie continues along this path, which I don't think he will. I think there was – it became a controversy because they decided to have – a. Uh, Campbell backed up by Dell. And I really think that was the plan all along Mm -hmm. just because, Hey, why would you put Freddie in net? If you don't have to after last night and knowing he's going to have to play potentially on Monday. Now, who knows what's going to happen because of Winnipeg, but right now, as it stands, they're playing Monday. Mm -hmm. I think one thing I kind of take from this, and I think James Myrtle has commented on it is that Anderson historically has had cold starts. Yeah, and oh, yeah, Fred the Denver one, or Fred yeah. yeah, Fred Tember. And the one thing I kind of think about is uh, how, how's that going to work in a shortened season where you know you're going to have more back to backs, where you're going to have more of these games where you know he's not going to be able to play like consecutive games every time. That <laughs> is that going to affect his play? Dan, he, Daniel makes a really good point because Freddie Anderson does tend to start cold at the beginning of the season but Mm -hmm. freddie anderson's also the same guy who likes to play a lot of games Mm -hmm. which is which is interesting because what ends up happening when that happens what i've noticed is he has a really good like he has a rocky start but it kind of goes up 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 and then it kind of starts to go down down and then it kind of levels off so I wonder if, you know, because it's a shortened season, they actually have a competent backup who's not named Hutchinson or Sparks. Sorry. I feel bad, but it's just the truth. Um, then they're in a different situation. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if they take this season, if Freddie kind of starts to get hot a little bit, they take the approach, well, hey, Freddie, you don't need to play every game especially the back-to-backs like Murray started back-to-back yeah and there was really no reason he had to like Koskinen started back-to-back I believe there but Mike Smith was injured you're not gonna play Stuart Skinner against the Canucks unfortunately um Mm -hmm. there's no reason that these goalies should be playing back-to-backs I also wonder if maybe the to make up for the lack of games the intensity of play I don't know if that's me talking out my butt, but I wonder if the intensity of how quickly guys are going to play, especially the Canadian play team so far, have been mm-hmm. so, so good. If that will sort of make up for those games that Freddie wants, because if he's also the same as a Rene or a Price that they love their games, they also love getting those volume of shots early. Right. And I wonder if that will sort of help Freddie along here. Because, you know, just some goalies are, well, goalies are weird normally, but you know what? Uh, maybe that's, that's something that helps him out too. And yeah. again, if, if Campbell starts playing better, Freddie's not going to like it, and he'll want you know, it, no. it. You try and hope they elevate each other, right? Um, yeah, you for want sure. to talk about the third line, right? Yeah, I, I absolutely adore the third line. I'm not going to lie. It's Kerfoot, Hyman, McKayev. Like, they're not the line that's going to stand out the most, but they're going to do a whole lot. 
That just screams four check. I hate playing against these guys. Yeah, I do. I do enjoy. <laughs> it is. I do do enjoy watching them. And, uh, my God, I can't speak English. I do enjoy watching them play. Um, they. I think they've been the most consistent line. I have a feeling it's going to be broken up soon. Because I don't know how long this Joe Thornton on the first line experiment can last. Yeah. Um, but I think there's things that can be moved around to keep some some type of consistency on that for on that third line. And it's it's unfortunate that it's gonna be broken up. I think Nick the Nick Robertson injury is going yeah. to change a lot. Um uh, I have we're probably going to see some different guys like I with Robertson out. I don't really know what's going on with Spezza. I have a feeling it's just for cap reasons. Yeah, these um, weird paper transactions. Some paper like, trans because yeah. I don't know cap shenanigans. I don't know. Uh, we're probably going to see Miko Lettinen soon. Like we're going to see new guys. Like this isn't this isn't the roster that's going to end the season for sure. Yeah, and I don't think Thornton would look terrible on the third line. That's the role he's no. been in San Jose for a couple of years. Natural Daniel, center. You, yeah. Were you about to say something, Daniel? Yes. Um, I feel like that's been a narrative a lot of teams lately where – and maybe it's just the increased depth, but like I feel like it's a return to a legitimate shutdown checking third line mm-hmm. of that hybrid style we see now of like, you know, they could also be a scoring line in and of itself that, you know, there's been more of an investment to that – to that understanding, I think they know that the season is shortened. There's going to be a lot more of these back-to-back games that you need more depth in your lineup. You're not just going to rely on the star players. And I completely agree. Like, I really like that line. I know it's probably going to get broken up based on how the injuries are going, based on how this tax- taxi squad balance is going. But I guess for now, I'll enjoy it until we see more changes. Mm-hmm. So shall we finish off talking about Jumbo, not Jumbo Joe Thor, another shark, Evander Kane. Sure. Uh, so Evander Kane, he was actually had an all right start to the season. He's had a couple assists. The Sharks have had a pair of a pair of interesting games versus the Coyotes. They've blown some leads and they were just kind of blown out versus them yesterday. It's a work it's in been, progress. Yeah, it's been a it's been a difficult start for the Sharks. Um, but unfortunately, Evander Kane has has run into some issues off, I almost said off the court. You, so much of the last dance, so much of it. I'm on episode nine. Um, uh, he's, Evander Kane has filed for bankruptcy, uh, apparently with a debt of over $28 million. Now, $28 million to us is not the same as Evander Kane, but still, $28 million is about half of his current contract. And I think part, you know, it's, it's a mess. Apparently, he owes his former agency money. There was a point where the Sharks are directly paying part of his salary to a bank. And then coming after him, the team was also went after in a part of it. Um, banks like Scotia and that have also been part of it. It is it had the picture of him in Vegas with a stash of money. Uh, doesn't yeah. look great. Um that didn't age. No, it did not. That's it, all. It's part of the hockey Twitter account images that preceded terrible events. <laughs> what a great yeah. follow, away. Eh? Um, but I think people need to remember one thing about Evander Kane is he has a young child, and I believe his I believe his family also suffered a tragedy a couple years ago with a young mm-hmm. child. Did a miscarriage. Yes. So let's not sort of forget that it's not just laughing at Evander Kane and calling him an idiot here. That he has a family he needs to provide for. Um, Though, and everyone thinks of Jack Johnson. In a different situation, his parents basically took his money. And bankruptcy from, uh, listen, uh, I'm not going to lie to you. At 21 years old, I'm not very familiar with bankruptcy. Um, But apparently this is a way that he'll really be able to actually, this can benefit him, Um, you know, like putting assets together and that. Though this, I don't know how to really put this. This isn't going to be very articulate of me. But this just sucks for Evander Kane. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Like he, it's it's a difficult situation. 
to talk about i don't really understand the whole chapter seven bankruptcy stuff um if i'm being 100 percent honest but yeah just being in this situation is obviously really bad to begin with yeah i don't know i think for me there's a lot of factors in there because i remember in the athletic article they talked about him also having a lot of dependents in his family which is understandable like outside of his immediate family he's he's also supporting yeah like two of his uncles and i think one aunt Mm -hmm. so i know i understand that there's that but the one thing that just kind of gets to me is the gambling debts yeah the one specifically is about a million dollars yeah and then there was one where i can't remember the specifics on this but in the article it talked about these things they give to customers where it's kind of like something you'll pay later on so you can keep on gambling so there's no limit and he didn't pay it he just walked out of the casino so and was that connected to the report that came out last season yeah it was about 1.5 million he owns in gambling debts I, I hope that going forward, there's going to be some people in his life that are going to be able to help him make better decisions in life. Um, not saying that maybe there are people in it now that have you know, tried to help him because there's clearly an issue here. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very simple to say right now, and it's the right thing to say, the three of us definitely wish Evander came the best and to his family. Luckily, he has come and it doesn't seem to have affected his play. Um, well, then I think his contract right now is $49 million. I don't know exactly how much of that for signing and salary has already been paid, but at the same time, players are going to be losing all like a lot of their money because of escrow and salary deferrals and all that. So, and I mean, this is probably gonna be the last big money contract that he'll have in his career, both because of his style and his end of his age. It, it just won't be there for him at the end of it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I believe that is everything. I am, um, Wish him the best. Yeah, wishing him the best. I'm looking at Twitter. I think that's everything today. Um, Mark Andre Fleury of the Golden Knights earned his first win of the season. Yeah. In those Number great pads. And 467 regular season victories of his career overall. So He's fifth right now in wins. Yeah, 17 more to match Ed Belfort. Um, I have here something about Spezza. Uh, someone's they're talking about obviously Spezza retiring. Um, Dreger tweeted, "Could be wrong, but if a team claims Spezza and he threatens retirement, I would think said team would place him back on waivers to terminate contract. Leafs would likely claim him back at that point." What if, what if you think Ottawa did it? You think he'd give it a second thought? Maybe come back as captain. Why not? He was captain for that one year, and then he's like, I want out, and then he gets traded to Dallas. I remember that. Well, When Alfredson left for Detroit. I guess with Eugene there, he's probably not going to be too excited. Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe that's everything for the show today. That is everything. Um, If you enjoyed the show, I mean, you can check out the YouTube version of where you can see a video of all our beautiful faces doing the show, as always. Um. You can check out halfway through the show where my light stopped working and I had to run away to try and fix it. It's fixed. Thank you, The Voice Ed, as always, for being a fantastic platform for the show. If you're on Spotify and or anything you listen to your podcast on, follow the show. Otherwise, how did you even get here? But still, tell all your friends about the show, too. We love it. If you're on, like, Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star rating and let us know. What do you think of the first sort of week of the season? Do it in YouTube as well. Who are you disappointed in? Who are you excited about? How do you feel about Connor McDavid? I love him. Best player in the world. Um, check out Alex's blog, Daniel's work for, we'll find out next episode, hopefully, if someone can get back to us with a voiceover. Check out my YouTube channel. HFR will be up later. And that's it. Thanks, guys. Yep.